Can I Kim? How are you? Hi, good. I feel weird being in this I know, you sit right back there. I've got to twist my head around to actually <laughs> see it. But nonetheless, my head is not polished and shiny, no. so that's I'm not a cone. Is, is that the reason we're swapping spots? Is it? So it is because <laughs> for some little cone here, the Dan Hagerwood character. So, <laughs> anyway, let's. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the CFME today, just because everyone is, and I thought we'd provide a little bit of an update as to where it is. And, and, and we like the Union, Let's be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, but let's jump on first to the NDA ban that's that's being proposed in. in Victoria. Um, it's interesting. It's only the second time in the world that a ban against a non disclosure agreement, and, mm. and can I say deeds of release you use commonly in sexual harassment cases? Yes. And really, all this NDA uh, piece of legislation is saying is if the complainant's fine and isn't coerced into it, you can have an NDA. Mm. But if the complainant doesn't want it, you can't enforce it. That, that's yes. the short answer, yes. isn't it? Well, it's not legislated yet. The Victorian government are calling for submissions from victims, business, workers, unions. The community. Let's hope it's quicker than the psych regulations. Yeah. <laughs> <Let's try. laughs> but can I just say to you, it's not a bad thing. No. Okay. The, the fact is that the sort of putting money on a string to a sexually harassed person saying, mm -hmm. take that, but sign away so you can't complain about it, yeah. is pretty often. What it does do is it, it hides bad governance. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, I think it's a good it's provision. A good thing. Can't be a bad thing. Either. No. So let's jump on to our next case which I'll be surprised by what it is. Well, look, this is, again, this is a really simple case mm. of, um, it's one of the first 10 or 15 cases that have come through seeking stop orders around sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Remember with bullying and sexual harassment, it's really straightforward. If you can, if, if the court or the commission is not satisfied that there's a continuing risk, they can't make the order. Mm. The person who did the wrongdoing here was full of remorse, deeply regretful, yeah. made it very clear there was no further risk. Yeah. And the result of that, there was no further order made. But I, I've only put this case in because it's not very good law. It's In fact, it's a bland sort of case. Mm. But it just shows you that when you have problems like bullying or sexual harassment, safety law says you must stop it. You don't have a choice about it. You must yeah. stop. Discrimination law says you must stop it, otherwise it becomes actionable. Mm. And it's a positive duty that now sits under legislation federally to, to stop sexual harassment. But the short answer is the moment you have, have any sense that it's going to happen, what you must do is protect the potential victim. Mm. And the moment you do that, that you put some walls around the victim so they can't suffer further, there is no application available, available to, them. to them. So I'm not being difficult for people who suffer it, but mm. why continue to expose yourself to another jurisdiction, you've already got three or four that you're exposed to. Mm. Why do something which is so plainly damaging for your brand as to end up in the Fair Work Commission for a yeah. stop order? Yeah. So, look, I put the case up there because I just thought mm. it's an interesting example of just how simple it actually is. Yeah. And the and employer in this case did put measures in place to separate the two parties and yeah. so they weren't involved in each other's work. So employees need to be and, proactive. And look, for the people, if there is anyone lifting their out here who could be a potential perpetrator, it helps to put your hand up fast. <laughs> you go, yeah, I'm really sorry. I should not do this. I yeah. will never do it again. It's not a bad thing to do. I probably got a bit carried away with that. We'll go to the next case, I reckon. <laughs> All right. I think 15 million is a bit fine, isn't it, for yeah. 650 underpaid employees. So. Well, it, it was repeated and systemic behaviour that, that, that the company had been engaging in since, what, 2009? Yeah, this is sushi chain. It's, yeah. Look, it's not surprising that it's in the hospitality industry. Mm. Um, most of you will know that the hospitality industry, if they were to pay what they're supposed to pay, would make it a very marginal industry indeed. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't say they shouldn't pay the correct thing. I'm just saying our wards have some real problems in it. Mm. For hospitality, the wards are really unhelpful. But this isn't about an unhelpful bit of behaviour. This is about a deliberate, systematic method of ripping off migrant yeah. workers. That's mm. the truth of what it was. Yeah. Um, and the federal court judge who ordered this has ordered the biggest fine by so much. Mm. But I think it's about time people understood. And the directors are also in the gun for this. Now, the organisation is bankrupt, okay, mm. so it's, it's gone into insolvency. Yeah. But it's got to be a lesson for everybody out there who, who once they have knowledge of an underpayment, or once they direct someone to be paid less than they know they're entitled to, this criminal liability emerges. Mm. And, you know, 15 million, you can't sell your house to get that back. Yeah. No. All right, let's go on to our next case. 
All right, multi-bargaining case, interesting. Again, I'll put this in because this is where the risk of supported bargaining really exists. And once again, it exists in places like McDonald's stores. So this is a South Australian application yeah. by a union seeking to bring 14 McDonald's stores into place to secure... Provide better job security, better rates of yeah. pay for the staff. Now, there's no determination that's been made at the mm -hmm. moment. It's just an application. There's a couple of other applications currently before courts. But I guess I want to say to people who are out there in franchise land, mm -hmm. you are the perfect target for this legislation. And, you know, as my daughters grew up, all of them went and worked in chain chain industries. All of them were paid unlawfully during that period of time, mm. even though their dad was a workplace lawyer. And I'd say, do you want me to ring them up? And they all said, no, 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 I don't want to lose my job. But I just want to be clear, three daughters, every single one of them underpaid, every one of them working unpaid overtime. This is an industry that cries out for intervention, but our unions are so so weak and so hopeless mm. that they don't have much of an effect. But supported bargaining allows them to actually develop an enforceable set of rights that they can pursue and allows unions to come through the door. And just so you understand, unions are dying in Australia, but they're not dying elsewhere. Mm. Because of the manner in which people have used workers, particularly in the United States, unionism is increasing again to actually deal with that. Mm. And in the food industry, although there is a high casual market, I think it's going to come back. And I think people are increasingly going to join unions to actually have some form of protection. So again, not a fascinating case, but a, I think a, a sort of window into where we're going with it all. Okay. okay, let's jump on to our next case. All right. I don't think I can even read that part of it. This is delay and disruption of industrial <laughs> <laughs> We've got a We had a screen. big screen and it broke. And now and we've now got, got a little screen. One. And Kim and I are both at age where <laughs> our site's not as good as it could be. Can I just say, as an off-sided thing, just because we've got a little bit of time, I'm very proud of myself. I've enrolled in the gym finally. Have you? And I've got a me metabolic age of 37. Is that <laughs> drinking or...? <laughs> Swearing? <laughs> <laughs> I, was I, I think that's fantastic. That's pretty good. Kim. That just shows you what a good well-being environment we've got. There you it? go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is a, a an electrical case. Yeah, so, nothing relevant to us, you say. I know. It's true. <laughs> well, it's on our aging electrical network, which has a metabolic age of about 180. But <clears throat> the unions put in bans and strikes, and what that did is it prevented or placed at risk people as a result of those strikes. So placed, placed people's lives at risk as a result. Mm. Now, there are provisions that sit under the Fair Work Act that allow um, the Fair Work Commission in, in quite drastic circumstances to intervene and stop bans and strikes. And that's what happened in this case because it's pretty clear as you start to read the judgment, it was a pretty predatory nature of strikes and bans that were occurring, which quite deliberately posed risks to people's lives. Mm. Pretty awful, I thought, as I read through this. But I, it is heartening to know that the Fair Work Commission can intervene. I put the case in for a really simple reason. The threshold is actually very high. Yeah. So, you know, not filling up petrol in cars so people can get somewhere is unlikely to ever be a ban or a strike that's going to be stopped. But where, through the action you take, you, you inherently create a risk to someone's life or welfare, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, or if it's larger to the economy as a whole, mm. then the Fair Work Commission will intervene. So a simple case, but when we're talking about it and people say, oh, our unions can bring us all down, they actually can't. There is legislation that stops them, mm. and here's an example of them being stopped. Now let's see if the writing is bigger this time so I can actually see it. I think this is a great case. Yeah. Um, only because it revisits something that we regularly revisit. So in this case, there's a principal contractor there was a subcontractor beneath it. The subcontractor's employee got impaled and killed. Mm. Oh, no, it was, um, no, it's the con no, sorry, that was the... I think it's actually the principal contractor's employee got injured. Yes. But it was a result of... The, the contracted, sub subcontractor's failure. Failure to manage the safety yeah. system. So this brings into line these moving parts in a case, okay? So a common law... What was the obligation the principal contractor acts owes to the employee? Okay, a non-delegable duty of care to make sure they're safe. Mm. So common law, no doubt at all, there's an action that's that's alive and going in respect of that. Yeah. Under safety law, 
principal contractors owe a duty of care to do everything that is reasonably practical to provide a safe workplace for their employees, the subcontractor, and their subcontractor's employees, oh, okay? Yeah. And what this case actually said is, yeah, look, it was your employee, but let's not get distracted from what happened. You knew because of things that occurred before where there was a, a, a wall that caved in, yeah. that this, this subcontractor was not up to standard. You didn't have swims. You didn't have all the things you ought to have done to yeah. satisfy yourself that somebody wouldn't be injured. It wouldn't have mattered whether it was the subcontractor's employee or your employee. It was your failure as a principal contractor to the contractor to mm. ensure they had an appropriate safety system that led to the liability in this case. Mm. And for the people who are doubters out there, forget about it was the principal contractor's employees. What this bit of safety law is saying is forget about it. The obligation is on the principal contractor to be satisfied that the subcontractor does have suitable systems to undertake the work based on their knowledge of risk. Okay, now if the subcontractor has expertise, that's a different issue around the expertise, but the general knowledge held by the principal contractor cannot be ignored. Mm. And the failure to have a basic system in place, which is required in every building site, is fatal. Mm. So not quite on point for the people who say, oh, you've got a subcontractor, you don't have to worry about it. But actually, as you read the case and you read the law, it's absolutely clear. This goes to the heart of our discussion every single time about subcontractor liability and the principal contractor's liability for subcontractor errors, even though it was their employee, is the same. Yeah. So interesting, I think. Yeah. Really, really interesting and good case. I thought the fine was a bit low, 375. Yeah, yeah. Well, New South Wales. Hmm. Victoria would be much higher. Yeah. And actually, this be truthful, would Quite potentially quite higher in Queensland too. Yeah. So it does depend whether in district courts and magistrates courts because there's different thresholds that yeah. exist. But New South Wales has traditionally been a lower fine state than Victoria. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what are we on to now? This is another uh, fine, but this was a five hundred thousand dollar fine. Um, where racking that had been installed but not adequately secured fell onto a worker and caused quite significant I think the interesting part of this case, yeah, so the, the company involved, so it was a racking issue, yeah. don't use the racking, the racking's dangerous, it's not suitable yeah. for use. The safety manager's job was to advise us the level of risk and all he did was give a direction yeah. not to use the racking. He didn't describe the level of risk that sat there and as yeah. a result of that when somebody was injured, the safety manager, whose job it was to communicate, and to ensure the safety failed in that obligation, he or she end up with a ten ten thousand dollar fine. I think. Mm, in the end. That's right. But remember, about four or five weeks ago, we talked about the changing of the guard and how safety managers are no longer safe from prosecution because they are increasingly becoming operational. And we keep saying that's where they belong. They belong inside the operational stream, mm. advising and developing the skills that are there. But when their role actually is operational then they have liability written all over them, yeah. okay? So very good case for the safety practitioners out there. Mm. Don't step away from engaging operationally, but remember you're an advisor, you're not an operational manager. It's a different job. Okay. Now, what are we up to? Oh. <laughs> this is a workers' comp one. Oh, Tasmania, good, this is yes. Tasmania, yeah. different than Victoria, I might add, but anyway. It is different, yeah. um, and another bad decision by a Tasmanian employer, which is disappointing, but anyway. Um, a worker had a accepted work cover claim. So Alan, had, Alan Blow's gone to kick Alison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of our ex employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. she's actually now in the AAT. So congratulations, Alison, for your appointment there. Okay. But she got a bit of a beating in this case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's probably right. By the way, I just want to say that. Oh, but do you? Yeah, I think. Oh, no. Yeah, I think. I, well, what happened? Um, there's provision in the act that if you've got a and same same type of thing in Victoria, if you've got a gap in certificates of capacity of more than 14 days, in Tassie you can actually dispute the claim, which the employer did in this case. But instead of waiting, as they should have, to go to the tribunal for a decision, they just unilaterally decided that they weren't going to pay the worker. Yeah. So... And not, can I say not an unfamiliar thing, is that that provision has been around a long time and that was advice that was traditionally given. What do you mean? Sorry. In other words... Way back when I was in Tessie, yeah. um, once it was in dispute, you didn't pay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so oh. this is an old piece of behaviour. Okay. This is a historical piece of behaviour. Oh. 
has existed for a long time. So if someone failed to put in a certificate, say there was a gap, you yeah. just go. That's it. Okay. Okay. Oh. okay. Go off and have a dispute. Can't get away with that now. No. <laughs> well, interesting. I don't think. I don't think that's what the legislation was intended to mean. I think that Eleanor's. No. Oh, sorry. Chief Justice, the Chief Justice's <laughs> explanation of it is is nice in policy, but it's not there in black letter. Whereas I think Alison's decision, in the first instance, was in black letter law, mm. and I wouldn't be surprised surprised if it goes on appeal. Okay. Mm. okay. But Victoria, so all, but it's all over eight weeks of pay. I know, yeah. but this is the very sort of thing where you want to have a fight over mm. it because it's a big thing. It's a practice that's existed yeah. for a long time. Mm. Victoria, what happens in Victoria? So in Victoria, you must have a valid certificate before you're entitled to weekly payments for any period. But what we see here is employees are able to get a backdated certificate. So if in this case they had a month gap, they can just go back to their doctor after that month and get a certificate backdated from the beginning. Yep. And then you're liable to pay. Yep. There you go. So. Terrible case. Okay, let's go. <laughs> you hate workers' comp. Oh, I just don't think it's law. <laughs> So let's talk about what's happening with the CFMU because there's a lot of hijinks out there. Mm. You know, I, I, every day as I, I on my laptop, I open the newspaper to read it, I hear something terrible new that's happening to CFMU. I just want to say nothing's happened yet. Can I just say yeah, that? That's true. Nothing <laughs> has happened yet. Uh, Albanese government said to the CFMU, look, let's appoint an administrator, would you agree? And they rolled over and played doggo and didn't speak to them again. While John Seeker was getting a tattoo, you know, God forgives, but the CFMU doesn't. Well, he's no longer there. He really isn't the sh sharpest tool in the shed, is he? But there will be an administrator appointed eventually, and that administrator is probably going to be Irving KC. He's quite a tough yeah, soul. Yeah, quite a tough soul. Um, that's not happened yet. It's likely to happen. It's likely to happen the next month or two. Yeah. That'll probably be for a period of three years because there's some legislation being introduced for that appointment. Um, that'll have layers of protection that sit around it. But what I can say to you is it's not, it sounds like it's a good answer if you appoint someone who's in charge. But um, if you ask a superintendent of a prison how successful they are in stopping prisoner behaviour, they'll tell you not that, not that good. Mm. So, you know, you can sit on the top of an organisation that's an octopus, but the arms mm. are still swinging out there. In, in the end of it, we're going to end up like we did with the BLF, with them just getting deregistered because mm. they can't stop themselves. Mm. I can't see the behaviour being put into administration that's going to have such a substantial change. The people who are still employed there are incapable of acting in a proper manner. But there will be power for the administrator to suspend people, discipline them, terminate employees. I they think. won't know about it. You don't reckon? Just have a look at what we deal with every day. Once a week, we have somebody saying, can we sign a patent agreement? And I don't have to ask what it is. It's always a CBD building agreement. Yeah. As I've said before, uh, most, the, you know, most builders association, the six major builders, and there's a lot more now, are all complicit in this behaviour. Yeah. They've all permitted this behaviour. So pointing an administrator, I saw... Um, Master Builders Association put a brand new ad going and saying how bad the CFM are you. I just want to say to them, where have you been? Like, where have you been <laughs> the last 10 years while this behaviour has been rampant? It's very brave when everyone else is doing it, governments intervene. But the short answer is everyone's in bed with each other with this, this illegality. And so... Yeah, you can appoint an administrator here, but are you going to do it for the builders? You're going to do it, are you? Mm. Really? How are you going to stop it? If a, if a CFMEU official comes and says, we don't want that new Chinese operator on site, and if you put him on site, I think we might have a few safety problems. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that some wise, <laughs> large builder is going to go, well, I'll report you to the administrator? <laughs> <laughs> I go, all right, we'll get him off, don't worry about it. So, yeah, it'll make some changes. It won't be great, but this is an utterly corrupt union and mm. it demonstrates corruptness for a number of years in absolute silence, both politically and industrially. Mm. And that means from employers, from Master Builders Association, who has gone along with the unions reaching an agreement with the major builders, which disenfranchises all small builders. And has gone along with that. Mm. The pattern agreement that sits out there for the CFME is too expensive for most employers who are builders to actually sustain. Mm. So it keeps the large builders and construction people safe. Yeah. 
So the truth of all this is it's good window dressing. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm. Mark Irving's a tough character. If anyone can do it, he can do it. Be. But my view is this is heading away the BLF. Okay. And I reckon in the end it'll be deregistered. Because mm. I just can't see the changes happening. Mm. Anyway, that's well, my view. We shall see. We go on to the, the problem. Yeah. I think you'll have to read the problem because it's it so me. small on this screen. Can yeah. I just say, how small is this screen? It's a very small screen. It's I'm going to read as well. Okay? I don't mind because I can't see myself. So that's I can me. I can see you. You've got a metabolic age of 37. Yeah. You look amazing on the screen. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. You notice on. I've been doing yoga every morning as well. <laughs> I need to sleep every day, but one. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a medical, metabolic age of a dinosaur. <laughs> Off you go. Right. Ben was late for work. He was tired because his new baby had kept him up all night. His wife was sick, so it fell on him. Ben was a crane operator for Big Bridge. His role involved lifting large concrete sections from semi-trailers and placing them for the team to embed in bridge structure. When Ben arrived at work 15 minutes late, he went to the crib room, found the supervisor and apologised for being late. His supervisor, supervisor's name was Tom. Tom asked him why he was late and Ben explained he'd been up all night with his young daughter and his wife was sick. Tom reminded him to be on time and always call ahead if running late as and was unacceptable. You like the poultice? I did like, like the poultice. It's a Perry Zolfel if you're out there, mate. That's your favourite. Oh. <laughs> Just put that in there. <laughs> um, Tom gave Ben a written warning, which was step one under the EA. Marie, the OHS manager, was present during the conversation. Marie was aware of several fatigue-based issues at the site, as it was a 24-hour site. There had been several occasions where employees were found sleeping on the job at night, a recent investigation she undertook in respect of a near miss revealed the reason a backhoe driver accidentally let his backhoe slip unoccupied trench. Investigation the AWU had raised the rolling roll. Oh, rolling rolling rolls that yeah, no, I thought this was for Nina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making it difficult for workers to get used to the sleep pattern. Marie had advised the director Angus of the issues on site for BB but had not made any recommendations. Angus took no action as he thought Marie had it in hand. Ben was on the same rolling roster and that was why he couldn't get family support during the night as his shifts kept changing. The site was governed by an EA that entitled delegates to be present during any disciplinary process. The relevant delegate was named Kim. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so somebody had spoken, young. <laughs> <laughs> she was unamused by the morning process with Ben. Um, she confronted Tom and was aggressive and angry. Tom told her to get back to work and stop wasting his time. She refused to move and demanded that he speak with her. He said that he was busy and if she didn't get back to work, she would get into trouble. Kim asked him if he was threatening her, that, uh, that, he, had, that he had punished a man who was fatigued and that she was here to have it lifted and the safety issue dealt with. Tom said if she said anything more, he would issue her with a warning and just get back to work. Kim walked away to call the union organiser. Unfortunately, seconds later, Ben lost concentration, slipping, slipping into a brief sleep while he was moving a large concrete railing to the north of the bridge. The crane proceeded to swing past the top of drop-off site, striking the portable toilets and killing a worker using the facilities. Okay, Andrew, is BB liable in safety law for what and why? BB is liable in safety law, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought so. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I thought we'd talk about fatigue for a really good reason. We've had a couple of fatigue cases. Mm -hmm. um, the last one was a truck driver but not um, not a logistics, you know, chain, chain just responsibility a case, <laughs> just a delivery guy. But... Fatigue is now being spoken about much more openly and we do understand what the levels of risk are. So an organisation that is told of that risk of fatigue to a person and does nothing about it is clearly in breach of Section 21 and 22 of the Victorian legislation as counterparts elsewhere because it's not a safe work environment the person is working. Secondly, they're meant to be monitoring a person's health. Part of monitoring someone's health is their capacity to work. Mm. So Ben was not fit for the inherent requirements of the job when he was working the other day. He was tired. Mm -hmm. It was like he was drinking. So he should not have been allowed to work until they were satisfied that he had had enough sleep, and if he hadn't, they should have sent him home. Mm -hmm. 
They didn't do that. Now, this is terrible news, isn't it, for all of us, because lots of us have young families mm -hmm. and lots of us are in this position. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was driving down because of this because Moon was just awake one night, a bit unwell, and I was driving down the freeway and I realised I hadn't slept and I was struggling to stay awake mm -hmm. and I actually had to pull over for 10 minutes and take a little bit of a walk mm -hmm. because I realised I was about to go to sleep as I was driving cars are weapons like any yeah. other else so yeah bp is liable bp is liable not only because angus knew about it so angus the safety manager and the supervisor all knew safety is a law of attribution their knowledge is taken as being the knowledge of the company yeah. <coughs> angus was told how dangerous it was by marie although marie did nothing about it and that it is an ongoing problem an endemic problem that exists inside the organization therefore they're at reckless endangerment mm -hmm. because they know the risk of serious injury it's the nature of the work they do is high risk and they were indifferent to that. So they're definitely in an, uh, definitely in their industrial man. So the answer in this case is no judge would accept that fatigue kills. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's such a new concept. It's not okay. gonna it's not gonna make it work safe wouldn't do it. Okay. So reckless endangerment. Angus, uh, he's right he there in reckless that. endangerment as well. Yeah. And I, I don't know, did we talk about Marie? Do I get stuck in a Marie? Tom, Tom and Marie, yeah. Yeah, look, Tom. The supervisor. Yeah, Tom, Tom's primary duty breach, unquestionably, he doesn't have the responsibility or skill levels. He's at the edge of reckless endangerment, more likely a primary duty breach. And Marie, I'm afraid, probably is reckless endangerment because here she is at the, at the hub of it when they need her advice. So she's operational. Yeah. So she's switched over. They say, look, what is that? What is it we should do? This is I present you with a problem. I'm the person who manages controls, and I give you nothing, mm. but I tell you it's dangerous. So I think Marie, as a safety manager here, who's the one who's really the court's going to be furious mm. at, and because, and that's why I've dr drafted this problem. Yeah. I drafted this problem to show you when a safety manager is at risk. So when a safety manager is seized with knowledge of a high mm. risk. Their job is to inform the business what is the what are the controls that should be taken, and they don't do anything. Mm. Then I think at that stage they're in the gun. Okay. I think the last question was: um, Does BB and Tom have any risks around general protections and safety law discrimination? I think they do, don't they? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, we what we can't forget now is there is a new law that sits around delegates' rights and what their entitlements are, mm. and the the treating of Kim in the manner in which she was treated when she raised issues which were industrial which were safety issues or workplace rights mm. yeah i think they have some real problems yeah. and remember it's you don't have to be terminated to have a general protection spot okay so look that's it for that's today it. kim we did pretty well didn't we on a tiny little screen where we didn't read anything we'll be back with our big screen next week don't worry we don't read anything um and look don't don't get caught up in the hyperbole around the cfmu let's actually do see what happens mm. But enjoy the pylon with all the at least courageous people in the world now come out and shout from the rafters what terrible people the CFMEU were. And what I'd like you to ask them is, what did you do two months ago? Where was your voice? I, I didn't hear it. Because that's why CFMEUs and organisations like them develop the way they do, because good people stay silent. All right, thumbs up. Bye, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.